Good morning. Welcome again to Smyrna Park AP Church as we continue our worship. And today we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Luke. We're going to go back into the Touch Me and See series. And just by way of announcement, uh, Glenn is, this is a, he'll be back in the office starting tomorrow and he'll be up here in the pulpit next Sunday. So if you're tired of <clears throat> me and my raspy voice, it will get a relief as will you next Sunday. So, but I get the privilege of closing us out of Luke 16. So last week we, talked, we touched on the, the permanence of God's law, and uh, as we continue to look at the scriptures here, this is Luke retelling Theophilus about uh, Christ's gospel and what it is he, he came and said and did, and, and encouraging Theophilus in his faith. And some of the things he re- records here are reminders, not just to Theophilus in his day, but it's a, the conversation we have today is actually a reminder for the, for the Pharisees of the day as well as it's a reminder for us. What's interesting here is when I was reading uh, uh, William Hendrickson's commentary on Luke, he said, he said this about this section of chapter 16 that we're closing out today. He said, when you look back at the, this discussion that Jesus has had with the Pharisees over the past couple of chapters, you look back in chapter 15, and Jesus is talking to the Pharisees about how they mistreated people. And then in chapter 16, he, he talks with them somewhat about how the Pharisees mistreat money. So, and then he closes his time talking to them with this parable that wraps up both, about how the Pharisees mistreat money and mistreat people. And what is even more astounding is that Jesus goes on to tell them that they had everything they needed to know the right thing to do. That their own, not just from their own history, but God had already spoken to them uh, what it is that the acts that they were supposed to be doing, that they said they upheld but failed to do. So we are going to be going back into the Gospel of Luke. Here in chapter 16, we're going to be reading verses 19 through 31. If you're using a pew Bible there, it's page 876 on, on that, uh, in that copy of the scriptures. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and the Word of God says thus. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off, And Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received good things. And Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here. And you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not do so, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Let us pray. 
Father God, as we approach this text this morning, I ask uh, again that as my words stay true to your word, that they would be taken to heart. But Father, if my words should stray and depart from your gospel, I would ask that they would be quickly forgotten so that your people will only ever and always see Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's in his name that I ask these things. Amen. All right, so what we have here in this parable is really a study of contrasts. First, we have the rich man. In fact, the description here that Jesus gives is that this guy is exceedingly rich. He makes a point of saying that he is clothed in purple, which is, believe it or not, that day and age, a dye that is extremely hard to come by and therefore extremely expensive, especially in Palestine. Only rulers had that kind of money in order to pay for, to have a cloth dyed in purple. And not only that, he wore fine linen. So this man had expensive garments to wear. And I love this word. And it says, and he feasted sumptuously every day. When was the last time you used the word sumptuously in a sentence? I, other than reading it here, I can't think of a time that I would just drop that. But there's your SAT word for the week. But what it means is that this guy, this rich man, had so much food he couldn't finish it all. And he had that kind of feast every single day. He had more than he could ever take in. If there was an individual that was, you know, living the dream, it's this man. Money and every earthly need that money can buy, he had it. That's how, that's how Jesus is presenting him in this parable. That's who this guy is. And then the, he tells us of a second individual and character that he names as Lazarus. And that name means God helps. So f- file that away for just a minute. Lazarus, and this is not to be confused with the Lazarus of John chapter 11, Jesus' friend who's raised from the dead. This is a, this is a parable, and that was a person. So this, these are two separate individuals that Jesus is talking about here. This poor man is described as someone who is laid outside the gate, outside the gate of the rich man. This is a guy who's not laid at the gate at the entrance to the city to beg from people as they pass by. This isn't somebody who's laid out on the main thoroughfare of the town to beg from people as they are going about their business. He's laid right outside the rich man's gate. That's where Jesus places him in this parable. He's right there. And the term gate there is a term as an, as an entrance that walls off where the palace is. Okay, that's the dichotomy here, the difference here, that you have a guy living in a palace that feasts sumptuously every day, wears fine linen, and here you have this poor man that's just laid outside his gate, perhaps in the hope that the rich man will do something for him. And he's too weak to move himself. And hoping that he's going to be fed, longing just to be fed by what falls from the rich man's table. Longing for food. And instead of being finely clothed like the rich man, it, it, the picture that Jesus says, it says, doesn't say anything about his clothing. It just says that this guy, not covered in linen, he's covered in sores. Probably because he's laid down and unable to move. And then... To top it all off, this poor guy is made ritually unclean because the dogs come and lick his sores, which means that he's unable to approach the temple until he is cleansed. He's too weak to even push the animals away from himself. So here you have two individuals, one in desperate, desperate need, and another who has means and opportunity to help, and yet does not. That is the picture that Jesus sets up. You have a rich man that has everything, 
and you have a poor man living, laid right there at the rich man's gate who has essentially nothing. And that's where Jesus brings the turn in this parable. Both of these individuals die. Look, look there at verse 22, because he's... Jesus is specific about the descriptions about how they die. It says, the poor, poor man dies, and he's carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man dies, and all it says is he's buried. Yeah. There's the picture. The poor man is carried by angels to Abraham's side. There's God's help. That this man's spiritual condition is not like that of the rich man who is simply buried. And then the very next verse says, he's in Hades. You know, this talks about the spiritual state of each man before the parable goes on. You already know kind of what's coming. You already know how these, how these individuals were. If you couldn't tell by the way that the parable was set up, you can definitely see it now as Jesus describes their deaths and how they were treated afterwards. You don't even see anything, you don't even hear about how the rich man's burial went. All it just says is that he's buried. You know nothing else about him, about what his friends did for him or anything like that. And so Jesus presents this great reversal. The rich man there in Hades looks up and he's able to see far off. He sees Abraham and he's able to actually recognize Lazarus at Abraham's side. What does that say about this individual? That he knows Lazarus well enough to be able to recognize him on sight and yet did nothing for him in his life. And he cries out, he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to me so that he can just dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. I don't know if you get the, the same visceral reaction that I did when I read this, but when I, when I read those words, I picture a man who, even though he's in Hades, he still treats Lazarus like a servant, like Lazarus is beneath him, like Lazarus owes him something due to his station. That's, that is very telling of me, that even there in Hades, in that place of torment, the rich man's heart remains unmoved and unchanged. And Abraham says he will not. It's, it's amazing. Here's the, here's the rich man who spent his whole life avoiding looking at the people he didn't want to see, and now when he need, but he instantly recognizes them when he wants their help. What does that say about us? Do we spend our time trying to avoid eye contact with people that we don't want to deal with, whether that be on the street or at work or in school, wherever it is? Do we just try to pretend that they don't exist until we absolutely have to deal with them? It's very telling about the human heart. But Lazarus is there at Abraham's side. And Abraham says, no, I'm not going to send him. Because you, you already received your good things. And Lazarus received bad things. And now we are comforting him. And now you're there in that place of torment. And that's not to say that being poor is a sign of spiritual maturity or strength, and that being rich is a sign of spiritual poverty. And the inverse isn't true either. Being rich does not mean that you're spiritually well off, and being poor doesn't mean that you're, you're spiritually lacking. Those two things aren't true. I mean, we've got Abraham right there. Abraham was probably outside of the kings of Israel and Judah, one of the richest men in the Old Testament that we have described. But what matters is what you do with the gifts that you are given. You could, take, you could pull this parable right out of Luke 16 and take it all the way back and stick it in Luke 6, and it will still fit the context. 
Because there, Jesus says something very, very similar, contrasting the poor and the wealthy. And he commends the rich who are doing what they can to help the poor, using their gifts to show mercy. Because, as he says, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. And Abraham goes on to say, besides all of this that I'm not going to send him to you, look, there's a chasm fixed between us. No one can cross. Even people who, in Jesus' parable here, who might have wanted to cross from heaven into Hades to relieve the suffering there could not, nor could the people escape their fate in Hades in order to reach heaven. It's, it is fixed. It is permanent. And then hearing this, the rich man then makes a second request. He finds some level of compassion in his, in his heart and in his soul. He says, still, treating Lazarus as a servant, send Lazarus to my father's house to save my brothers. And Abraham's response to this is, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. The rich man says, no. If someone comes from the dead, they will repent. Another pointer that somehow the rich man's brothers might recognize Lazarus if he were to come back from the dead. Again, pointing to maybe perhaps the spiritual state of them as well, that they cared nothing for the poor man while he was alive, because how do you get to your rich brother's house other than passing through the gate? Right past poor Lazarus there lying in the street. Abraham comes back and says, if they don't hear, if they will not hear Moses and the prophets... I tell you, they're not going to be convinced if someone rises from the dead. You know, we just celebrated Christmas, and one of my favorite Christmas traditions is watching A Christmas Carol. It's one of my favorite stories around this time of year. We actually watched, we watched a couple of different uh, versions of A Christmas Carol this year. And you all know the story. It's a story of probably about one of the most loathsome individuals in all of English literature, a man by the name of Ebenezer Scrooge. What a great name. A man so wealthy and so concerned about money that he is unwilling to use it for good or even for himself. It's remarkable that his, in the story, his nephew Fred says, who is he punishing? He's punishing only himself. He, has all, he could do all of this good, not just for everyone around him, but also for himself, and yet he does nothing. And his friend Marley comes back from the dead and says, Scrooge, I've returned to give you a second chance. And then he goes and has the journey with the uh, Christmas spirits of past, present, and future, and Ebenezer changes his heart. My friends, that's not how it works. That is a great story because the human heart wants to believe it has a second chance to make itself right. And I will tell you now, your heart cannot make itself right. Moses and the prophets spoke everything that the rich man and the Pharisees there and the rest of the people of Jerusalem and, in fact, you and I need to hear about the, about the gospel. It's all right there. You know, you can imagine the Pharisees, they've done this before. In the beginning of Matthew and the beginning of Luke, John the Baptist accuses them and says, don't say that you have Abraham as your father. And even there in the gospel of John, when the Pharisees are arguing with Jesus, not just about you know, who his parentage is, but they come out and say, we don't, you're of the, your father, the devil. We're, our father is Abraham. And Jesus' response to them is, 
man, if your father is Abraham, you sure don't do the things that Abraham did. So how can you call yourselves sons of Abraham? That's in John chapter 8. A group that we know saw later Jesus raise someone from the dead in John chapter 11, raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. And the very first thing that they decide to do after this miracle, was it repent and believe? No. The first thing they decide to do is they plotted how they could kill them both. How can we kill Lazarus again And how can we kill Jesus? That was their decision. It was not repentance. And when Jesus returned from the grave after being hung on a cross, what was the first thing they did? They tried to hide the fact that it ever happened. So Jesus Jesus speaking through this parable, Abraham's words, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, somebody coming back from the dead is not going to convince them. It is it is right on point. I am sorry, Ebenezer Scrooge. It, without the Holy Spirit, you are damned. And that is, that is the way it goes. Zechariah was talking with the people as they returned from the land, and he had this same warning, a warning that this group should have heeded and that Jesus is pleading with them to hear as he talks about Moses and the prophets. This is what Zechariah said to the, to the people returning from the exile about what had happened, why they'd gone into exile, what had happened to the Jewish people previously. He says this in in Zechariah 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. Let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. And he goes on to say, but they, the people before the exile, refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they may not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words of the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. That was, that was Zechariah's warning to the people that returned to the land. Don't be like the people who lived here before. Don't make your hearts hard. And here we have the Pharisees that are, are doing the same thing. If the, if the rich man in the parable had listened to Moses and the prophets, if the Pharisees were listening to Moses and the prophets, then they would, re, they would recognize the phrase, that Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. They would have heard the prophets talk about God saying that he desires mercy and not sacrifice. They would have heard the prophets say that if you want to be just, then you will live by faith. All of these things that we take as New Testament truths were all spoken in the Old Testament. The prophets said those things. That is where the ideas come from. The the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. There's no difference. The truth that he spoke in the Old Testament is the same truth that he spoke in the New, and vice versa. Jesus is quite right. If they are unwilling to hear the scriptures, they will not hear what God has to say at all regardless of the person that brings the message. And friends, you have something more than Moses and the prophets. You have the rest of the story. Whereas the Old Testament could only look forward to a time when Christ would come, where is the Messiah? We're waiting for him. And we trust God to bring about all that he said that he would do, you live in the time where the Messiah has already come. And more than that, you have the Holy Spirit residing within you. That, the text earlier that we read in, uh, in our uh, reading at the start of the service, where Jesus is there and he's talking with the disciples, and the disciples you know, tell, them, tell him everything that transpired, and they talk about it, 
the word they use. We had hoped that he would have been the one that was to redeem Israel. And Jesus' response is, oh, you foolish ones. How slow are you to believe what? Everything that Moses and the prophets spoke. And then Jesus turns and opens up the scriptures to them. You can have that same conversation. You don't need to wonder about what that conversation was in Emmaus. You can have that because the Holy Spirit resides in you and you have God's word right there in front of you. The interpreter of the scriptures is already with you. I urge you, friends, I've got one last Christmas gift for you on this day, a day that in, on the church calendar we call it Epiphany, it is the, or Twelfth Night in some traditions. This is the twelfth day of Christmas, and I'm not talking about twelve lords leaping or whatever it is. Uh, it is the day that we celebrate the arrival of the Magi to Mary and Joseph's home, and they're presenting gifts to the Christ child, gold and frankincense and myrrh. This is the gift I have for you. In fact, you already have it. Do not neglect the scriptures. Do not harden your heart to God's word. Do not think that you need something else. Don't fall into the trap of, of the rich man that, you know, we have Moses and the prophets, but we need something else. We need one more thing. That is a lie. What does Zechariah say? It says, those people, they harden, I love that description, diamond hard hearts. They were so set against stopping up their ears and not hearing what God had to say. Friends, don't do that. Open the one last gift, the permanent gift, as we found out last week. The law and the prophets, God's word is not going to fail, and it is also not going away. Abraham's plea in the parable is the plea that I have for you. You have Moses and the prophets and the gospels and the apostles. Hear them. Hear what they have to say about how much God loves his people and loves you. About what he did in order to bring about your salvation. Be encouraged that you are loved more than you could possibly know. And the only way that you can know that is if you read God's word. Hear of the one who came from heaven. While we were still rebels and evildoers and cursing God's name, he came to pull us out of that and to bring us inside. He did not leave us wallowing outside the gate. He came outside and brought us into his house. And more than all of that, he made us a member of his family. Hear the words. Take up God's word and open up the gift that has been given to you. Particularly as we celebrate Christ's sacrifice this morning through the Lord's Supper, remember again that this sacrifice, Christian, was for you. If you would, please, as we turn there now, pray with me. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your word, the gift of your scriptures, and the gift of your son, that you did not, you never left us alone, but you always were calling to us. Lord, we thank you that you took our hearts of stone and gave us hearts of flesh. Lord, in this new year, as we, in our humanity, say that 
we've reached a new milestone, a new year's, a year's past and a new year's come. Lord, they are all the same to you. <laughs> Don't let us allow this time to slip away. Encourage our hearts. Give us the faith to believe and the minds and eyes and ears to open your word and to hear you and to do what you command. Father, we ask uh, as we approach this table this morning, a time where we remember the sacrifice of your son on our behalf to bring us to yourself. We ask that you would please uh, set aside this bread and this cup from their common use to the use in this sacrament as we dedicate this time to you and we remember again who it is you are and what it is you've done. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Our words of institution this morning come from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I passed on to you, that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Poured out for you. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. In the tradition of the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America, the denomination of which this church is a part, we have something that we call fencing the table. And that fence is there not to keep people out, but it is to show you the gate to the way in to receive the table. That's, that's its point. So Christian, if you profess in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you receive and rest in him alone for your salvation... This table is set for you. There is no one that can hinder you from coming. However, if, friend, if, I, if you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you're still struggling what it means that he is both God and man and what it is that he came to do, that, that somehow he has died to pay for your sin, I would ask that you would refrain from coming to take these elements. They are, they are not for you yet. Instead, I would encourage you to look again at this parable and think about what does it mean that the Moses and the prophets, that, that I need to hear them, and how is it that Jesus paid for my sin? Reflect on that. If you have questions about that, please feel free to come up and see me after the service or ask one of the elders you see standing uh, in the back or up here serving uh, during communion. They would love to tell you about who Christ is and what he came to do. Uh, it's, it's a joyous story to tell. But if you remember at some point, either a long time ago or maybe even fairly recently, that you, you placed your faith in Christ, but you know that you're not living the way that Moses and the prophets and the gospels and the apostles said you should live, and you feel worn down and broken by the world, and your faith is just a bare kernel of hope. Friend, I, I plead with you, come again to the table and taste and see that the Lord is good. By way of administration here at Smyrna Park EP Church, uh, I would ask that you would please uh, come down the center aisle to receive the elements, and you are free to partake them here at the chancel or, or over on the sides, or even return to, please feel free to return to your seats and, and take the elements there. Uh, <laughs> If you are unable to come forward, please just raise your hand, and we have uh, an elder who has come and serve you where you are seated, um, and uh, join us in the celebration of this, uh, of this supper, Christ's body and blood, broken and poured out for you. For these are the gifts of God, and they are for the people of God. <laughs> 